The Fourteenth Year of Chinjua. Chapter 105. The Deep Affection of Siblings. Are you doubting if this would work? Tang Fan cocked his head, seeing his sister's slightly strange expression. Tang Yu hesitated. We plotted against the He family before but will they consent to this? I'm afraid that the He patriarch will be the first to refuse. He lightly laughed. You don't need to worry about that. We'll handle the second young master He first and then I'll handle the He patriarch. Apparently, Master Tang was capable of resolving others' troubles very handily but when confronting his own troubles, his brain frequently seemed to get soggy and he would constantly do things that made one unsure of whether to laugh or cry. Tang Yu couldn't help but poke him awake. You need to find a chance to be frank with Guang Chuan. Don't be fussy for no good reason. Huh. Tang Fan's face went blank, instantly completing the transformation from outstandingly shrewd to dull-witted. Wa what did you say? Listen to that, he even actually stuttered. Tang Yu placed her hand on her forehead, giving a long sigh. When she had learned about this last night, it had shocked her beyond compare. Today, her emotions had gradually steadied and her logic had gradually returned to her. After analyzing all sorts of merits and drawbacks, gains and losses when it came to Tang Fan, plus seeing how he was now, she felt some sympathy for Sui Zhou. Nothing. All follows the laws of fate. Sister Tang had been visiting temples to worship the Buddha occasionally as of late, so she now had a bit of mysticality in her speech. If you spend your life happily, our parents in the Nine Springs will definitely be at ease. Tang Fan's hair stood on end from her meaningful look. Sui Guang Chuan, you wretched man, he thought to himself. What did you tell my sister while I was away? Commander Sui who was currently devastating his subordinates in the Northern Administrative Court Division training grounds, lightly sneezed. From then on, Tang Fan infrequently sent people to ask after his brother-in-law's current situation. Seemingly, He Lin had indeed calmed some, as he didn't make any fuss when he was sent to their old home in the countryside for his studies. The He family speedily moved to the capital. On the day of their moving banquet, Tang Fan brought He Cheng for a visit to hand over gifts himself, which gave enough face to Patriarch He. The latter naturally reciprocated, gifting He Cheng many things in turn. Tang Fan had many same year friends at Hanlin Academy, and Wang Ji was on duty in the palace. The hearsay he had told Tang Yu was reliable, as after not too long, the court announced the news that a provincial grace branch of the exams would be opened this autumn. This year, a provincial grace branch and the next year, a metropolitan grace branch. There was a basis for the opening of the grace branch, of course. As was known, the emperor had truly deep affection for consort Wang, and because her 55th birthday would be next year, he planned to open a grace branch in order to celebrate his favored consort's longevity and paint up her renown. Though no one dared to say so, Flattery took hard work and whether it was common opinion or the court officials, impressions of Lady Wan were not very good. There was no lack of civilian novels based on her, which portrayed her as a shrew who terrorized the emperor's harem. Just because they didn't like Lady Wan didn't mean they would hate the Grace Branch, though. The scholars of the land were naturally pleased to be able to have another chance at getting on honorate roles, individually gearing up to bury their heads into strenuous study. Those that were already county honorates but situated too far from the province capital, needed to leave their homes and get on the roads early, lest they got delayed and missed their exam schedule. Of Patriarchy's three sons, two had already gained their honors and become court officials, while the second young master he alone was agent of county honorate status. The second young master he naturally refused to relinquish this opportunity. Every day, he studied hard in the old country home, waiting for when he could become a provincial honorate to let out a sigh of relief. He Lin had failed to make the role so many times, that even Patriarch he didn't hold any high expectations for him, to say nothing of anyone else. He already had two promising sons, anyways, adding the second young master he to that would be more of a good thing, but if not, it would be no big deal. 
when it came to He Lin's temperament, patriarchy worried that if he became an official, he would offend someone, then bring calamity onto the He family. Such a thought made it seem that He Lin's failure to place was actually a good thing. He Lin himself certainly didn't believe that, though. The provincial exams were his only opportunity to reverse his fortune. As he got older and the years passed by, he was too afraid to imagine the shameful scene of him still going to the tests with graying hair. Harboring such a notion, he exerted nearly all of his power in preparing for the Grace Branch exam. Under such circumstances, Tang Fan found a chance to travel to Xiangyi County's countryside himself, paying a visit to his sister's husband. He Lin was astonished at this visit and had a coldness that was difficult to conceal. Tang Fan didn't care, simply chatting happily with him for a time, speaking only perfunctory pleasantries. In He Lin's eyes, his brother-in-law was amply devious, sinister, and full of schemes. People of different paths did not seek each other out, making himself have the patience to speak with him was uncomfortable. Seeing that the other man was going around in a circle, he Lin couldn't help but ask his guest to leave. Is there something urgent? If not, I will go to study. Tang Fan didn't mind it. How are your reviews going? Fine, He Lin answered coldly. The other laughed. I heard that the presiding examiner of Northern's Hilly next year will be Pan Bin, Pan Zilin. What of? He Lin's voice abruptly cut off. He was not up to date on current affairs but he had heard before that this Pan Zilin seemed to be Tang Fan's senior disciple brother. What are you planning? His expression darkened, as he only believed Tang Fan was wanting to trip him up. Tang Fan inwardly shook his head. The second young master he's biggest issue was not that he couldn't pass the provincials but his personality. It didn't require careful thought to know that if such a man even could get into officialdom, it would likely be difficult for him to receive promotions. Perhaps Patriarch he had seen as much, and thus didn't have any expectations for his second son. In order to get He Lin to understand what he was hearing, Tang Fan had to switch angles, though he couldn't be too explicit. My senior's personality is one that doesn't seek merits but does seek to not offend. It may seem like mountains are not fond of being level but at the provincial exam scene, it would be better to have more caution. I have a few eight-legged essays here, all made by capable people. A few among them are ones I did in the provincial exams, myself. If you don't disdain doing so, you should take a look. He had once read He Lin's typical essays from Tang Yu. The writing wasn't too shabby, really He Lin had been called a child prodigy in his youth, so how could it be? Moreover, not only was it not bad but it had quite some literary flair, giving even the strictly demanding format of eight-legged essays color. Even so, it was too pompous and He Lin was too high and mighty, having to add in his own thoughts and opinions every time, thus leaving an aura of arrogance on the paper. If he was lucky enough to come across an examiner of generous personality, that would be fine. If he came across the kind of examiner that preferred over-caution, or one that wasn't fond of his style, he would be out of luck. Tang Fan surmised that that might be the reason why He Lin had been able to test into being a county honorate but had repeatedly failed to be a provincial honorate. By the by, the examiners to be in Northern's Hilly's provincials Pan Ben aside would all be older and wiser men. Were the second he's bellyful of whining to be brought to the exams and written onto the papers, it would most likely be thrown out again. Tang Fan had taken great pains, too, intentionally going on such a big detour to make He Lin pass the provincials on the proper route. The selected essays couldn't have any relation to the current examiner, either. It really had taken a lot of effort. As for whether He Lin would be able to puzzle it out or not, that would depend on the man's own destiny. His goal achieved, Tang Fan didn't stay longer upon seeing He Lin's persistent confusion, soon getting up and taking his leave. He Lin wasn't yet the pinnacle of stupidity. He had thought that Tang Fan had come here to show off his own dazzling achievements and mock him but after the other left, he did a lot of thinking, and finally grasped something of what the other had been playing at. He immediately picked up the essays Tang Fan had left, pinched his nose, 
and studied them thoroughly, meticulously, and repeatedly. He had failed too many times. Regardless of Tang Fan's intent, he didn't have any further option but to try. Starting out with not too much hope in his last-minute effort, after he came back from the provincial exams, he didn't loiter, heading straight back to the old country house. When the autumnal exam spots were announced, and the old servant that helped with reading the roll came back to report alongside the notifier bearing the good news, he was in disbelief, as if he had fallen into a dreamland. I actually made it. He Lin confirmed his name and place with the notifier over and over, dazed, afraid of the great embarrassment that would happen if they had gotten the wrong person. The notifier must have met many like him before, as he smiled without impatience at He Lin's endless checks, then took out a big red roll call for him to verify it. 93rd place, He Lin. Provincial exam enrollment had a set number of spots that varied by province. Northern's Hilly had the most out of all, having about a hundred spots for each provincial branch. 93rd place was not much at all, but compared to all those scholars that had fallen off the roll, He Lin had gotten really lucky. The He family soon learned the news of He Lin's achievement. Even Patriarch he couldn't help but inwardly sigh for heaven's blessings. Evidently, his decision to make the other return to their homeland for studies had been a good one. If he had let He Lin move to the capital and face this world of distractions, he might not have been able to calm his mind enough to prepare for the exams. The He family had only just moved to the capital, so having family friends in it was quite out of the question but Patriarch he still had some old friends from his days in bureaucracy. The third young master he was appointed to the Ministry of Justice and had also forged some friendships with his colleagues, when those people heard about the second young master he passing the provincial exams, they all dropped by for congratulations, saying that Patriarch he was mighty blessed to have two sons on official paths, and now even his least remarkable one was having a lucky turn, the misfortune turning into a boon. This was a portent that the He family was on the verge of a flying rise to the top. No matter how anyone else gave their praises, He Lin knew best of all that if Tang Fan hadn't given him hints and those essays at his visit, he would not have been able to pass the provincials. To say it differently, despite his high self-regard, he hadn't gotten to the extent where he viewed nothing around him as important, or felt himself to be the sole supremacy in all of the world. He didn't understand why Tang Fan had helped him but upon thinking about it, he could only attribute it to Tang Yu and He Cheng. The Tang and He families were still in-laws. In this day and age, particular attention was paid to the wife relying on the husband's nobility. Were he to be met with contempt, Tang Yu and He Cheng would subsequently be met with mockery. For his sister and nephew, Tang Fan would inevitably lend a hand. After figuring that out, He Lin didn't feel a single bit of happiness, simply determining that in the next year's Metropolitan Grace branch, he had to get on the roll without relying on anyone. Tang Fan would take a nice long look it wasn't like he wouldn't be able to get it apart from him. Having that motivation, he had a rare bout of not going wild with happiness after passing the exams, and didn't go to visit the Tang home. Contrarily, he rejected Patriarch He's proposal to let him live in the capital, and proceeded to stay in the old home in preparation for next year's metropolitan exams. Perhaps he understood him too well, as Tang Fan didn't come to bother him, nor did he ever drop by to flaunt his credit for the achievement. After He Lin passed, the Tang family was quiet, neither sending gifts of congratulations, nor sending word from Tang Yu and Tang Fan. The other side's calm reaction just made He Lin felt nervous. He was used to everything being a hassle, only able to think poorly of the Tang family and that Tang Fan looked down upon his insignificant provincial honorate status. He wanted all the more to make a stunning hit at the Metropolitan exams, and let the Tang see how tremendous he was. Time passed in the blink of an eye. The third month's grace branch in the 19th year of Chinjua soon arrived. He Lin smugly stayed for three days in one of the Ministry of Rights's numbered rooms, then sent a servant early to go read the list on the day of its release, feeling both tensed and ecstatic. The entire morning, 
he had paced around a study in the He family's capital house in order to get the role's information in a timely manner, after the provincials, he had finally set aside his ego to move from the old country home to the new residence. Patriarch he was also sitting in the study to await the news. Even though he did not place as much value onto He Lin as he did his other two sons, that didn't signify that he didn't wish for He Lin to pass. A son having promise would be a father's delight. Besides, having three palace honorates in one family would be a hundred times more impressive than having two. Noticing that his mind wasn't at peace, the patriarch deliberately diverted his attention so that he wasn't unduly anxious, and there would be seen of joy when the time came. After passing the provincials, did you ever send someone to give word to your wife and brother-in-law? Didn't you send someone for it? Patriarch he hated his lack of ambition. Is me saying so the same as you saying so? That's your wife and her brother. Seeing that his father wanted to berate him again, he Lin had to frown. Wouldn't it be even better to wait until I get palace honor it for that? Giving this a thought, he added something else. The Tangs don't look highly upon us at all. I heard that mother invited them for a small get-together for her day of longevity, but they refused. Why bother rushing to press myself against someone else's cold back? They sent gifts. There's nothing impolite about them coming or not, the patriarch raged. How did you get to be such an idiot? Tang Fan is already unhappy with you. If you don't take chances to mend your relationship, how long will you need to wait? Are you going to cast your wife and son to Tang Fan for all time, making him help you with supporting them? What vexed He Lin about his father was how he readily scolded him, yet whenever he saw him interact with the third young master He, he was never so harsh in words. Presumably, he liked He Lin the least. Right when he wanted to argue, he heard a burst of rushed footsteps came from outside. Despite feigning a calm look of carelessness, he had long become skittish at heart, and jumped to open the door. Standing outside was the steward, tailed by the servant who had been sent to read the list. The two's faces did not have the joy typically seen when their master had passed a test but instead hesitation. This sight made He Lin's heart promptly thud. After experiencing years of failure, he had gradually turned desperate for exam luck. For this metropolitan exam, despite his hard work and immense hopes, he was not conceited enough to place himself as prime or second scorer. In his opinion, being a second role palace honorate would be a hugely pleasant surprise. How was it? Patriarch he asked. I must inform you, master, second young master, that this lowly one looked all around the roles, and did not see the second young master's name, the servant hesitated. But it may be that my lousy eyes weren't working and I couldn't read it clearly. I asked that another be called over to take a look, in case I made an error. The patriarch felt a wave of disappointment. How would the servant have ever dared to come back and report this, had he not verified it multiple times? He Lin's name must not be on the roll. He Lin was even more disappointed than he was. He stood there mutely, only hearing that he had fallen off the placings yet again, no other words left to enter his ears. What stunning hit! What scene would the Tangs be looking at? His previous ideas were now turned into complete jokes. He had really thought that he would turn upset into a cause for celebration, only to end up having the heavens play a trick on him. Could it be, that being a palace honorate genuinely wasn't in the cards for him? Following his burst of disappointment, Patriarch he let it go. He Lin was not his only son and he had been lucky enough to pass the provincial exams. Making extravagant demands was ultimately rather greedy. For He Lin, however, this was a fatal strike. During his time of near collapse, Tang Fan dropped by again. He Lin believed that he wanted to mock him but that was him underestimating him. Were it not for his sister and nephew, Tang Fan wouldn't have come to do this. The previous setup had come to fruition and it was time to take back the net. He arranged for He Lin to meet him alone in the study, then got straight to the point. Do you want to keep taking exams, or do you want to get right into your official career? 
He Lin was caught off guard, furrowing his brows as he stared at him. What do you mean? You are a provincial honorate, so you can go straight to being an official. It will be a lower post but promotion won't be an impossibility for the future. I can help you, if you want to take that path. Of course, if you want to continue taking tests, you can do as you will. Forever having vigilance and guard towards Tang Fan, He Lin asked, why would you help me? What are you trying to get? This time, it wasn't that He Lin was overthinking things and Tang Fan didn't hide anything either. I want you to separate from my sister. Also, Kilang must change his surname to Tang. From that point on, you two would no longer be married. He Lin grasped Tang Fan's plan at last. He grew immensely angry and said with a sneer, you believe that I'll sell off my wife and son to seek fame? Tang Runking, you're really despicable. Don't even think about using that as blackmail. Tang Fan did not get angry, remaining calm. I urge you to consider it. My suggestion is actually perfect for both sides. There's a vacant post for official mentor of Mayun County. My own post isn't prominent but I would have no issue in helping you out for this. Your two brothers are also in officialdom but they probably won't be able to help you with anything right now. As long as you perform spectacularly in your first three years, you can be promoted to county magistrate. Your future would not be any lesser than that of a true second role palace honored. He Lin was struck stupid, speechless. You're still young, the other continued. Remarrying and having children wouldn't be hard for you. Kilang will only be one of your many children, but he was carried by my sister for ten months. The weight in values there is clear. If you're willing to adopt my plan, it will give you a hundred advantages with not one harm. What if I refuse? He Lin gritted his teeth. There will be another metropolitan exam next year. I can pass it with my own ability, so why would I accept your charity? Tang Fan lightly smiled. You being able to pass on your own ability is something you could do, of course. What can I say on that? However, above board people have knowledge of the self. Think about this carefully the official mentor post will not be open forever. Many people in this world want to be official so if you refuse, others will certainly be willing. After passing by this village, there will be no shops, if you have regrets, by then I might be powerless to help you. Furthermore, I'm not handing out charity but performing a collaboration that benefits both sides. If you agree, my sister and I will be grateful to you. No matter what, Kilang is your flesh and blood, and that will not change he will not refuse to acknowledge you as his father because of the change in surname. He and my sister are simply disappointed in the He family and no longer want to be involved in it. He Lin's expression changed. After a good while, he said, I want to meet with her. Who her was, Tang Fan knew well. In his mind, He Lin had no belief that Tang Yu would be so unfeeling towards him. Tang Fan nodded. You may. Three days later, by means of his connection to Wang Ji, he reserved a private room in Xianyun restaurant for Tang Yu to meet He Lin in. Tang Fan himself withdrew. It was unknown what discussion his sister and the second young master he had but upon seeing Tang Yu return looking relieved from a burden, he knew this matter had its proper end. He agreed to it, he asked. She nodded, then immediately became a little worried. Do you think the He family will have refutes on their end? Tang Fan laughed. They definitely will but they're not able to plot any good way forward for He Lin. Even if they oppose it, it won't work. He Lin is Kilang's father. As long as he agrees, everything will go smoothly. This ended with He Lin taking his suggestion instead of waiting to take the exams next year, which demonstrated that he was not certain that he would pass them. Just as Tang Fan had said, opportunities were transient, with a whole gaggle of people busting their heads open to get even that official mentor position. If he gave it up then failed the exam again, he would have lost his wife along with his army. Tang Fan was actually a little confused, though. Gee, do you really detest the He family that much? 
Why did you insist upon changing Kilang's surname to Tang? Are you not unwilling to take a wife for right now? I won't force you. You can get married whenever you like. If Kilang changes his surname to Tang, that can be something of a justification to our parents. Gee. He suffered a shock, having never imagined that her insistence upon the surname change had such an idea behind it. No wonder he had always felt that her behavior of not loathing the He family very much, yet persisting with getting He Cheng to leave them, was really strange. Fluffy, if this were the past, I might have still urged you to marry soon but I don't think that way anymore. I don't want you to be like me or your brother-in-law, where you were forced to bond. Even if it gives you momentary bliss, it will turn you into a pair of resentful spouses as time goes on. I only hope that you live a happy life and don't need to suffer any sort of discomfort. Do you understand, she spoke softly, touching his shoulder. Her little brother had gotten so tall. She could no longer reach up to pet the top of his head. You seem intelligent but in truth, the closer you are to someone, the dumber you get. I can see something of Guangzhuan's intent towards you and you should get this over with, too. You can't lead people on, you have to be clear on what exactly is happening. Out of nowhere, this was the topic she was bringing up. Tang Fan was stupefied for half the day, his face that was typically thicker than the skin of a boar slowly turning red. What crap did he say to you? She smirked. He didn't say a thing. If you want to know, you should go ask him. End chapter. The 14th Year of Chinjua Chapter 106 Fine jade strung by beaded, silken thread Tang Fan carefully mulled over his sister's words, getting the overall sense that there was a deeper meaning within them, and seemingly another motive. In truth, from the time he had returned home drunk from Wang Ji's home to today, more than a half a year's time had passed. During this period, Suizhou had gone on several assignments out of the capital and was seldom able to spend a few successive days peacefully at home. Tang Fan himself had been posted at the inspectorate which due to being particularly short-staffed these years, had particularly large workloads allocated to each individual. This was especially so with a superior like his teacher, Chiu Jun, who had strict demands of his subordinates. Even in the capital, Tang Fan frequently left early and came home late. It was difficult for the two of them to find days where they could spend time together like they had in Daytong. However, Tang Fan had always kept such in mind. As was known, Sui Zhou had previously stated that he would get married at the start of spring, even though Tang Fan seemed to have vaguely heard that he wasn't taking a wife, he had never found an opportunity to question it. The matter had been set to the side. They appeared to have reached a sort of implicit understanding, neither taking it upon themselves to bring it up. That was, until today. His sister's words had finally made Tang Fan come to a decision. He planned to wait until Sui Zhou was off duty to make things clear to him. However, he waited here and there, looking on until the curtain of night fell but the man's figure didn't appear. A bit anxious, Tang Fan went straight to the Northern Administrative Court Division to find him. Outside of his expectations, he was informed that Sui Zhou had received another out-of-town mission at the last minute, and was preparing to head for Tong Zhou overnight. It wasn't long since he had set off, so if he went now himself, he would probably be able to catch him up. Tang Fan's mind was on fire, caring for nothing else. He immediately borrowed a horse from the office people to run to the city gates. By the time he did, it was already dark and the gate was soon about to close. Scrambling forth, he managed to catch sight of a group that seemed to be about to leave the capital, and immediately shouted out, Sui Guang Chuan. He hadn't even been certain that Sui Zhou was amongst them, yet that shout unexpectedly drew the entire group into successively turning their heads and there Sui Zhou was. The latter said a few things to all his companions, allowing them to proceed with their journey before him, then turned his horse back. What happened? Seeing how he was panting, 
Sui Jo wanted to take a handkerchief out to wipe off his sweat for him out of habit but just when he lifted his finger, he stopped moving. No one could have been able to detect the slightest flaw. For this over half a year, he had been carefully measuring himself. They seemed to have returned to the days where they had only just met and not known each other for very long. Despite living under the same roof, Sui Jo had never said a half word of ambiguity again, nor made the slightest ambiguous action. That should have made Tang Fan relieved but for some reason, he was not as happy as he had expected himself to be. A stomach full of words spinning in his throat, all he ended up asking was one thing, why are you going on another trip out of the capital? Sui Jo hummed. Imperial orders. I'm going to Tong Zhou to handle something. Simply worded, without a bit of nonsense. Not even his goal was ever revealed. Tang Fan cupped his hands, voice a little sullen. Then, have a safe trip, and come back soon. Sui Jo nodded. Thank you. With that, he turned his horse in preparation to leave. A scant few words, nothing else. When had they become so estranged? Tang Fan felt inexplicably uncomfortable. Seeing the other man's figure appear to become one with the darkness, he turned reckless not making a sound as he leaned right forward to grab the other's arm, only to almost fall off from his horse. Luckily, Sui Jo reacted in time, turning around to hold him up by the arms, then bringing him back onto his own horse. He himself dismounted, and dragged the other off. What are you doing, he coldly rebuked, anger inside his tone. If I wasn't paying attention to what was behind me, you would have fallen off. Tang Fan smiled sheepishly. I wasn't being careful. Sui Jo went silent for a bit. If there's nothing else, I'll take my leave. Tang Fan couldn't drag this out further, so he lightly coughed, took something out of a pocket, then handed it over. I just saw this on the streets and bought it. Take it and have fun. Not waiting for Sui Jo's reaction after that, he turned and rode off on his horse, kicking up dust. Sui Jo was a bit mystified. He bowed his head to check the thing out using the light from the moon, seeing a piece of jade in his palm. It was warm to the touch and its make was a little inferior, as if it really had been casually bought off from the streets. Upon a closer look, the janky beaded string tied through the jade's hole, seemed to be Ah Dong's handiwork. Raising it up for a sniff, there was no fragrance to it except for the smell of simmer-fried eggplant. And he recalled that when Ah Dong and the rest had dinner last night next door, they had eaten simmer-fried eggplant. What kind of ploy was this? He carried the jade with him out of the city, head full of fog. Everyone was waiting for him at the outskirt post house. It was too late in the day, making it unsuitable to get on the road but if they didn't leave the city then, the gates wouldn't be open when they tried to leave early the next day which would cause a delay. Hence was why everyone had planned to rest for a few shishin in this outside post house, then get on the road when daybreak came. Journeying with him was the Minister of Revenue, Yu Sui Jun. Seeing that Sui Jo was holding a jade pendant, he teased, so, Censor Tang calling you over was to hand over a love token for someone else. Dark-faced, Sui Jo vaguely grunted. Never before had he received a love token that stank of eggplant. In any case, Tang Fan suddenly giving him a jade must have had a deeper meaning. Thinking of how Yu Sui Jun was also a palace honorate and a cultured scholar, he humbly asked for guidance. Please instruct me Minister Yu, is there something I need to understand in this? Did you give the other party anything prior? No. The implication a gift of pretty jade had was quite simple. Since antiquity, there had been a saying that when toss a quince, get a jade back, but he was getting the sense that Tang Fan wasn't going by that, else he would have had his own jade pendant. Why take the trouble to steal Ah Dong's for the gift? Let me see, Yu Sui Jun said. Sui Jo passed the pendant over. Yu Sui Jun found it poor to say that the beads had been strung uglily, so he could only pick out nice sounding words. Hmm. The make is average but it has a young maiden's full heart in it, uh, 
Why does it seem to smell like fried eggplant? Yu Sui Jun looked it over for a time, then returned it with a smile. Have you ever read a certain poem by Po Chin, Envoy Sui? Despite being well versed in writing, Sui Jo was not a true scholar and had no specific knowledge of such things to speak of. He shook his head in response. I wander outside the eastern gate, where I meet a noble heir of great. I follow to a secluded room, attending to him with garments grabbed. No vows made beneath the mulberry, near the roadside, we are together. Engaged I am by his lovely looks, pleased is he by my countenance, too. How to convey our sincerity? Slip on the arms two golden bracelets. How to convey our courteousness? Fix the fingers a pair of silver. How to convey delicate feelings? Appoint two pearls upon the earlobes. How to convey our joint devotion? Tie a sachet behind the elbow. How to convey our pining, yearning? Wind around the wrists two long ribbons. How to bind affections eternal? Fine jade strung by beaded, silken thread. Hearing the last two parts, Sui Jo couldn't help but be shocked. Such an open implication how could he not grasp it? Though, was that actually what Tang Fan wanted to convey? Was that dead tree having a day of revival? Yu Sui Jun kept talking on his end. Presumably, this young lady has deep feelings for you and she finds it hard to say directly out of embarrassment, so she had to choose to express it this way. Such touching affection, Envoy Sui is truly blessed beyond compare. Seeing no sort of joy whatsoever on Sui Jo's face, then remembering that eggplant smell, Yu Sui Jun seemed to understand. That lady's hopes were likely all in vain. He stopped poking fun, going to rest after saying a few more things. He could have never imagined that Sui Jo's mind had long come to be a total wreck, or that he itched to turn around, grab that man and interrogate him thoroughly. However, he had a job to do and the city gates had long shut. All he could do was forcefully quell his burning mind, focus on his task, and ask later. Tang Fan had no idea of Sui Jo's reaction, of course. While on his way back, he was still measuring whether his act of gifting Jade had been too cryptic. With Guang Chuan's literary talent, he likely wouldn't be able to guess the poem. He had taken A Dong's jade pendant at the last minute and hurried out, buying her another piece in compensation was a trifle. When Sui Jo came back, and she saw her pendant show up with him, who knew how she would react? Were it not for the fact that his own jade pendant had no beads but a tassel, he would not have done such a thing. Thinking as much, Mr. Tang held his forehead, troubled over how to fix this disaster. Just like he had a headache, he Lin had a headache, too. He Cheng changing his surname and the separation was too big of an event. Knowing that he wouldn't be able to keep it a secret, he informed his parents of it after his return. Once Patriarch he and Lady Sue heard, it was like a bolt from a clear sky, turning them both stiff. In the current age, Men from decent families would not marry into the bride's family as it was dishonorable and viewed as a disgrace that cast aside one's ancestors. Unless there was no further path of survival for him, no man would ever agree to it, let alone allow a perfectly good descendant to change families and be handed over to someone else. Had the He family been impoverished, this would have been fine but they were clearly a family of standing. How could they allow their son to do such an unrefined thing? I knew those Tang siblings had no good intentions. Now they've even wrested our grandson away. Lady Sue couldn't resist shrieking out, disregarding her typical dignity. Mother, don't get angry. Listen to what brother has to say first. He Xian, having rushed over at the news, couldn't help but mentally shake his head. What was even happening? What could he say? How has our family reached the point where it sells off its grandsons? Second, did you never consider our reputation when you did such a thing? How do you view the He ancestors? Lady Sue pointed at He Lin, hand shaking out of anger. Patriarch He was much calmer than she was, tamping down his anger to speak to He Lin. This was nothing more than a private talk, right? 
That road hasn't yet been crossed, so it can just be like the gibberish that comes after drinks. Tomorrow, I will go find Tang Fan and request that he withdraw this proposal. I don't believe that he wouldn't even give me that face. You don't need to go find him, he Lin answered. I already signed the necessary documents. Both Patriarch He and Lady Su were taken aback. Once the authorities process it, Kilang's surname will change, and then I'll separate from Lady Tang, he Lin continued. After the separation, the documents will be nulled. How would that be seen as losing the family face? Brother, how could you be such an idiot? He Xian stamped his foot. Even if you separate, what could be done? Once Kilang changes his surname, outsiders will say that you're powerless to the point that even your wife and son don't respect you. That won't put your reputation in a good light. And I have much of one right now. He Lin asked coldly. Tang Fan agreed to help me get past this blockage by offering me a post. What did he promise you? Patriarch he asked. Official mentor of Mayun County. That little job won you over. You pawned off your wife and child for that. The other became furious. His face flushed red and he pressed on his chest. Lady Su and He Xian rushed up to help him upon seeing this. Since they have no will to remain in the He family, why force it? Father, do you think I don't know that your refusal to let me separate from Lady Tang is for no other reason than to pave a path for the third young master? Has he ever let you down, the patriarch fumed. He's a he and the he family is good are you not? You can't become a palace honorate, so you're keeping your own brother from success. He Lin sneered. The issue there is that the Tang family doesn't want to be bound to us at all. You're scrambling to hug their thighs but have you never considered how they would regard us? No matter what, I'm Kilang's father and I've already agreed. If Lady Tang treats Kilang well, then whether he changes his surname or not, he's still my son. With that, he swept out his sleeves and left, not paying any further attention to the expressions of his parents and brother. He Lin had always been a lone wolf of reclusive personality. Over all these years, Patriarch he had grown used to that and yet he Lin had decided to separate from Lady Tang and let Kilang change his surname without permission that was both unacceptable and incomprehensible. Yes, the He family had no shortage of descendants. He Yi had three sons at his knees, and He Xian had a son, too. He Cheng's courtesy name of Kilang had been granted according to the lineup of his same generation brothers in the family. Without him, Patriarch he had four other grandsons from his non-concubine lineages. That generation could be labeled as thriving but the families of his eldest son and third son's wives had no in-laws in them like Tang Fan. The joining of two families by marriage was not only for the purpose of producing offspring but for having mutual support. This was something commonplace and yet a friendship spanning two generations had been completely severed when it had come to He Lin. The patriarch was really of the mind to beat his unfilial son to death. Father, what do we do now? Do you want to go to the Tang home? He Xian asked. Patriarch he waved him off, dispirited. That the Tangs came up with this means that they were scheming for a long time. Since the second young master has consented to it, our descent will have no use and if we force it, we'll instead make enemies of them. Forget it. Just let them be. He Xian stamped his foot again. How did the second young master bungle a perfectly good marriage like that? The Tang's conduct has not conformed to etiquette and they were clearly in a rush to cast us aside, like they were afraid that we might ask something of them. How about I get a peer to denounce Tang Fan? Are you a fool? The patriarch shouted. Will denouncing him make our reputation all shiny? No matter how we speak of it, this is a family matter. Both of our families have officials in them tell me, how will the authorities judge that? Don't be an embarrassment, just let it be. The second young master will fix the problems he causes, and you'll mind your own business. He Xian hesitated. But, if this goes on, the Tangs will have a complete falling out with us. Won't Tang Fan take that chance to build obstacles for me? 
The other laughed angrily. You think too little of Tang Runking. If he wasted energy on such petty affairs, he wouldn't have his current post. Listen to your father. You're in the Ministry of Justice, so just do what you need to do and don't criticize him behind his back. We were indeed the first to let him down about what happened with the second young lady and Kilang, so this recompense should be enough to calm his anger. You don't need to overthink, though I do have a warning for you. Hearing his father get serious, he Xian stood solemnly. Please speak, father. That your second brother had this day was entirely his own fault, and caused by his personality. No one else can be blamed for it. Since he was able to decide to get this minor post, if he mends his ways, he will still have room for redemption. If he can't, his life will be a total waste. Your mother birthed all three of you yet you all have distinct personalities. The eldest has a wealth of calmness but lacks drive. To be able to sit in the post I had before retirement is the apex of his sky, and it's difficult for him to advance further. The second will not be spoken of. As for you, your personality and aptitude are not lacking and you're now at the perfect age to be a palace honorate and get on your path in bureaucracy. Your only defect is that you frequently view little schemes as big ones and that is a huge taboo in officialdom. Little schemes can work for a small while but will make it hard to walk far. Take Tang Fan, for instance, setting his quick rise aside, if you were made to go to Daytong to puff sand, would you be happy? Would you be able to perform beautifully under those circumstances? Would you dare to oppose the Wan party? He Xian felt that an aspect of that had some logic while another aspect, he couldn't help but argue against. But with the Wan party constantly suppressing him, no matter how promising he is, it will be difficult for him to have any sort of great luck. The Patriarch sighed. When observing any situation, your eyes must look into the distance. No one dares to provoke the Wan party but will it live forever? To put it disrespectfully, is its 10,000 years of longevity actually going to be 10,000 years? Both He Xian and Lady Su were shocked by his unscrupulous words. My lord, the latter quickly called. Patriarch he waved his hand. There are no outsiders here, I'm guiding my son. What level of society does the Wan party rely upon? Only the one seated above them, right? They clearly appear to have no one brave enough to oppose them but who isn't suppressing their ire? Tang Fan looks to be on a rugged road now but once that dark cloud covering his head is gone, the career path he has today will be his future qualifications. He Xian was pensive. Having not yet expressed himself, the other added more sparks. I'll ask you this, when in the ministry, what did you hear that was related to him? He was exceptional polite to his superiors and warm to his inferiors. Is no one unhappy because he drove Liang Wenhu out? Some were but not many, only a few. Most had a bad impression of Liang Wenhu to begin with, believing that he was too domineering, and they sympathized with Tang Fan. This son also heard that the former minister, Zhang Ying, had even more praise for him, and it was because of his support that Tang Fan was brave enough to oppose Liang Wenhu. Patriarch he shook his head. Did you know that Zhang Ying was once a member of the Wan party? He Xian let out an awe. Ah. He was? I never knew. The crux of it is here. Before Tang Fan entered the ministry, Zhang Ying obeyed Wanan. After Tang Fan entered the ministry, Zhang Ying was demoted to Nanjing because he presented a memorial contradicting Wan An's will. If anyone said that there was no connection at all, I wouldn't believe them. Following his settlement in the capital, Patriarch he had regained contact with old friends, some of which had not yet retired, giving him a source of information. He Xian was astonished. Are you saying that Tang Fan encouraged Zhang Ying to oppose Wanan? He can't be that tremendous, can he? Of course not but it had to have something to do with him. I'm not saying this to frighten you, nor to tell you to promote others' ambitions while destroying your own. I only want to let you know that there is a lot of deeper knowledge herein. If you don't understand something, 
speak less and observe more until you do understand. Based on my comprehension of Tang Fan, he will not take revenge against you because of the issue he has with your brother. That would be too unlike him. Your brother is your brother and you are you. If you have the chance to, you can still forge a good relationship with him. Understand. This son understands, he Xian accepted. With no obstruction coming from the He family, things went a lot smoother. Because of Tang Fan's connections, the government's processing efficiency was rather quick. This case of Aksara locality first, separation after was pretty uncommon but not rare enough to make everyone raise their eyebrows. Many bizarre people and events had existed in the Great Ming, by comparison, this incident was completely inconsequential. Tang Fan was not an unreasonable man. He knew that despite He Lin agreeing to it, this matter had only gone so smoothly because Patriarch He didn't cast any obstructions to it. Cast a peach, reciprocate with a plum through his former colleagues in the Ministry of Justice, he asked them all to look out for He Xian some more so that the latter would not be at a loss for what to do when he entered the ministry. Compared to Tang Yu and He Lin's separation, He Lin's marriage to his bride's family and He Cheng's change of surname were not things that many knew of. Following them, all that happened was that He Cheng's name was quietly scratched off from the He family's register. Most solely heard that He Lin had separated from his wife and inevitably mocked him behind his back as being so hopeless that he couldn't even keep her. However, by that time, He Lin himself had already gained the post of Ma Yun's official mentor with Tang Fan's help, and headed off for Ma Yun County. Official mentors belonged to a class of tutor officials, mentors for estates were palace honorates but county mentors only required a provincial honorate or tribute student to fill the post. The He Lin of 20 years ago, who had been wholeheartedly thinking to get his name on the golden roll, wouldn't have thought much of the post but things had changed with time. Nowadays, he was fully satisfied with being able to get a county tutor position. The He family, its patriarch especially, did not hold too many expectations for He Lin's future career. He had truthfully disappointed all of them too many times before. Now that he was going to work on another county instead of staying at home and blame everyone but himself all day, they finally breathed a sigh of relief. The ways of the world varied and the minds of people were hard to predict, however. No one would have thought that, after a certain number of years, the one exceeding all expectations would be He Lin. That was all a story for later, of course. That which was not important to the now was not to be brought up for the time being. With things resolved from He Lin's end, this aggravating familial matter came to a close at last. Yet, not long after the start of spring, something happened. End chapter